So many of you know that science is being plagued by issues of bias and data transparency and censorship. So I'm going to talk about those issues, but a change of pace, I'm going to use statins as a case study. So just a, um, a refresher for all of you, statins are one of the most widely prescribed cholesterol-lowering drugs in the world, with Lipitor actually being the most profitable drug in the history of medicine. And despite the fact that their patents have expired, uh, John Ioannidis from Stanford University predicts that uh, cumulative global sales is expected to reach a trillion US dollars by 2020. So we're still in a situation where statins are big business. Now, there's been an exponential rise in the use of statins. It was originally um, recommended for people at high risk of cardiovascular disease. So that's people who've already had a heart attack or a stroke. And that's not really controversial. There, there seems to be consensus about this. But where opinions started to begin um, to be divided was that um, experts started saying, well, perhaps everybody over the age of 50 should be prescribed a statin. Um, even if they don't have high cholesterol. We heard from um, pediatricians saying, well, maybe we should be screening children for high cholesterol so we can identify potential statin recipients. And Pfizer even marketed a chewable grape-flavoured statin so it would be more palatable for kids. Um, there was a very high-profile cardiologist in the UK that suggested that statins were so safe and effective that we should use them as condiments in burger outlets to counter the effects of a fast food meal. So when you grab your burger with your salt and your ketchup on the side, you grab a statin as well. We've even had debates about putting statins in the water supply. So how did we get from recommending medications to a group of high-risk individuals to now even debating about putting statins in the water supply? A lot of this has to do with conflicts of interest. So there's this group called the National Cholesterol Treatment um, uh, Education Program in the early 2000s decided to revise their definition of what they call high cholesterol. So they simply just lowered the threshold. And so by lowering the threshold of what they call high cholesterol, it means millions more people become eligible for these medications overnight. And this is concerning because eight out of nine of those people that made that decision had direct financial ties to statin manufacturers. And people become concerned that a group of nine people can really make recommendations for the entire population. Industry bias is another issue in um, uh, the statin data. We know that in the 1980s, when US um, President Ronald Reagan significantly slashed funding to the National Institutes of Health. This allowed private industry to move in and start funding their own clinical trials. And this is essentially what happened with the statin trials. The vast majority of statin trials are funded by statin manufacturers. We know that when this is the case, you see an exaggeration of the benefits of a drug and a minimization of the harms. Now, there are ways that you can do this when you fund your own clinical trial. You can design it in a way um, that underestimates the harms. For example, run-in periods. Now, this is where they give everybody the statin for a period of six weeks, and then there's a whole group of people that drop out through that period of six weeks through side effects, feeling bad, not, not wanting to comply. Then, with that freshly culled population after six weeks, they start their randomization to placebo or the statin group. So you can imagine at the end of the trial period, the rate of harms is similar in the statin group as it is in the placebo group, because all of those people who would have complained about side effects actually dropped out in the run-in period. And this is what happened, in, for example, in the heart protection study, which underpins a lot of our understanding about prescribing statins in secondary prevention. They had a 36% dropout rate in their run-in period. Now, they say it's to monitor compliance and make sure that um, people comply with the medication through the, the actual trial, but the effect is that it grossly underestimates the harms. And we think this is why we see a change in the rate of um, harms observed in the clinical trials, which are said to be quite low, um, compared to real-world observations where doctors say sometimes up to 20% of their patients have these side effects. 
Another issue with statin data is that there's uh, an egregious lack of transparency. There's a lot of missing data that we don't have access to. And um, there's a unique situation that happens um, here where the CTT collaboration or cholesterol treatment trialists is a prominent group of researchers at Oxford University. Um, and they are led by the CTSU um, and Rory Collins heads that. And they're in this unique position where they have exclusive access to individualized patient data on statin trials. And when I was researching this area for a documentary, I wrote to them in 2013 and I asked them for access to this material and they confirmed in an email that they um, will not share this data with third parties because they signed a legally binding agreement that meant in order to gain access to this data, they wouldn't share it with anyone else. So this is a situation here where data is there, it's present, but it's not to be shared with independent researchers for authenticity. And the very purpose of science is about its contestability and its ability to um, you know, have reproducible results. So this hasn't been possible to do. Now they say, well, it's okay, you know, we're, we're independent, we're not funded by industry, but we know if anyone's familiar with the big saga um, between the BMJ and Rory Collins in 2015, that he did disclose the CTSU has received over 260 million pounds in funding from manufacturers of cholesterol-lowering medications. Now, the reason this is concerning is because this group periodically publishes um, meta-analyses which advocate the wider use of statins. And these uh, meta-analyses are very influential on prescribing guidelines. They've even been influential with the Cochrane Review Group. So prior to 2013, Cochrane reviewers expressed caution when prescribing statins in primary prevention. But then in 2013, they did a complete backflip on their decision. And they started proposing that um, perhaps there is evidence for statins in, um, at people at low risk. And they admitted that their decision was based solely on the analysis from the CTT collaboration. And this is the same group, by the way, that cannot share their data with anybody else. And in the conclusion of the Cochrane Review, they said statins did not increase the risk of serious adverse effects. But can they really say that if they haven't seen the data? They're only really making that assessment based on what's present in the peer-reviewed literature, which is essentially what the drug companies want you to see. So they were called out for this in an editorial in the BMJ where the authors said that um, the Cochrane group acknowledged that the adverse effects were poorly characterised in the clinical trials, but disappointingly Cochrane had showed, shown no appetite to seek out the patient level data for its next update. So we're now in a situation where, you know, we've got to ask the question, is Cochrane currently its best self? If it's going to stand up to its pillars of data um, transparency and open access, um, you know, we hope that this is the direction that they go in to seek uh, individual patient data, regulatory data. Um, and We've known for a long time that there's these issues in the clinical trials, so it was proposed in 2014, uh, sorry, 2004, that we introduce regulations um, concerning clinical trials intended to safeguard uh, patients and lend credibility to su the subsequent trials. And what they proposed was that if you're doing a clinical trial, um, you register it on a recognised database, and clinicaltrials.gov is one of those databases. And someone became curious, they thought, well, I mean, will our universal understanding of the balance between benefits and harms of statins, will they be changed by a change in regulations? Well, someone published this, I know that writing is quite small, but really it's just a list. They looked at an assessment of the randomised control trials of statin interventions since the regulations had changed, since they'd introduced stricter rules on um, uh, registering your clinical trials. Um, so this was done by a cardiologist called Robert DeBroff in the US, published last year, and he found that no trial found a mortality benefit, and that two-thirds actually did not 
find a cardiovascular benefit with statins, and he concluded that cholesterol reduction via statins is not a powerful intervention for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. So this is quite shocking, um, given that um, a lot of the uh, early intervention trials in secondary prevention, pretty much what we base um, our consensus of recommending statins in secondary prevention, were all done prior to a change in these regulations. So there's a lot that's happening in this area. Um, terrific work by uh, Peter Gocher and colleagues um, at the Nordic Cochrane Centre. They were able to do something that many people said would not be possible, but uh, Peter's tenacity um, uh, was successful in getting the European Medicines Agency uh, to open up access to unpublished trial reports and protocols. And this in turn gave us access to clinical study reports, I'm not going to say too much about them because you're going to hear about it in the next talk with Tom Jefferson. Um, but these clinical study reports written for the drug regulators contain substantially more information about the medical intervention um, than you would normally see in a peer-reviewed journal. And there are some very val valuable lessons from Tamiflu that we could learn and you'll hear about soon. But in my view, I think this is the way of the future. This is where we're really going to gain um, the access that we need to, uh, the, to medical interventions. Um, we just need more researchers like Tom Jefferson and Peter Doshi to take this on board. All right, I'm going to finish off by talking about my experience as an investigative journalist. Um, I uh, worked at the Australian Broadcasting Corporation for uh, over 10 years, and the ABC, unlike the ABC in the US, the one in Australia is um, a public broadcaster with no commercial advertising. And uh, life was going great until 2013. I um, produced and presented a documentary which looked at the overprescription of statin medications. So we talked much uh, uh, essentially about all the stuff I've talked about today, so I won't go through it again, um, but essentially we questioned the overprescription of statins, the conflicts of interest and the bias in the literature that exaggerates the benefits of these medications and underplays the harms. Now, when this program went to air, we, see, we received an extraordinary amount of support from the public. It rated really well, and we received thousands of letters and social media reports congratulating us for finally um, just discussing and bringing, up, uh, bringing out an issue uh, that required an important debate. Um, it wasn't long before the ABC received complaints, for example, from the National Heart Foundation. They have a decade relationship, um, with a decade long relationship with the pharmaceutical industry. They actually call it the pharmaceutical round table, where one representative from each drug company sits around a table and talks about um, statin interventions. Of course, AstraZeneca, Merck, Sharp and Dome, and Pfizer, which are the three largest statin manufacturers. Not surprising there that they complained, and Medicines Australia, which is the industry group that represents pharmaceutical companies. So, as I say, it wasn't that much of a surprise. We rolled up our sleeves and began uh, answering the complaints. But then something quite unexpected happened. Um, someone went on national radio and said, people will die if they watch these programs. And it was very disappointing to us that it actually came within our own ranks at the ABC. Um, a very prominent ABC uh, radio journalist um, and uh, doctor, Norman Swan, uh, don't know what motivated the complaint, but it had the effect of sparking national headlines. So this was across the nation. Um, you know, cholesterol program will kill people, people will die, um, could contribute to deaths. ABC has blood on its hands, right? So you get the idea of how the media was kind of enjoying this sort of internal feud. Well, that's essentially how they were uh, depicting it. But the effect that it had was that it really laid the foundation for a, a long and drawn out uh, scare campaign. ABC programs were um, accused of causing potentially uh, fatal heart attacks and strokes, 2,900 fair effort. Uh, Rory Collins came out in the UK media and said that people who questioned statin side effects were far worse and had probably killed more people than uh, the paper on the MMR vaccine. 
There was a prominent cardiologist out of Cleveland Clinic said we need to push back on people challenging statins as they're part of an internet cult. Uh, they started using different terminology. So they were calling us statin denialists, myself and colleagues, um, you know, kind of playing on that new change of, you know, we're as bad as the climate change denialists. And I put this here because this just happened last Sunday um, in big, bold letters on the front of the Daily Mail. Um, there's a special place in hell. Um, um, they mentioned some of my colleagues um, who uh, question the validity of statins, particularly in healthy people, um, calling it deadly propaganda. So th this kind of campaign is actually really quite effective because Firstly, it um, deters any journalist from ever trying to question the value of these medications or raise issues about the underestimation of the harms. Secondly, the effect is um, that it, it positions you where you kind of don't want to be. They put this label on you that you're an anti-vaxxer, that you're pseudoscientific, that you're a denier, flat earther, mass murderer. And that becomes very difficult to contest in public. So I had a lot of advice about how I deal with this. It was a lot of legal advice, actually, um, uh, because I was in a situation where I couldn't contest any of it. So I was issued with a gag order from the ABC for a period of five years, and it became virtually impossible to try and defend myself. I was told repeatedly over the years in certain ways through conversations and emails. This is actually an example of one of the emails. Marianne must not comment publicly nor privately share details of this with anyone in the media. We consider this a breach in her contract conditions. It wasn't written in my contract that I had to abide by a gate order, but I still was afraid that I would lose my job. Um, you know, we strongly recommend that Marianne accepts this um, decision, quietly accepts this decision, and protesting will not be helpful at this time. So I loved my job. I wanted to keep it. I obeyed um, the rules, and I didn't contest these. And um, I think as a result of this, uh, my reputation and the reputation of the program um, suffered uh, quite dearly. And uh, we continued to do programs, but it became almost impossible to um, tell a fulsome and truthful story because people would keep referring back to the statins episode where I'd killed all these people. Um, you know, so holding industry to account became very difficult. Um, I would, uh, my stories would constantly get diluted. Um, they'd take controversial comments out of the program. Sometimes they'd drop controversial people altogether. Um, I, I, as Peter alluded to earlier, I did a program on antidepressants and um, that story didn't even get to air because they thought, oh, the same thing's going to happen again. You know, the um, you know people will uh, will die if they go off their antidepressants. So in the end, did it serve us well? Well, no, not really, because the ABC banned the the programs, and they um, so now are not available on the ABC website. They're still available on the internet, I should say. Um, but that was a real disservice because it robbed the public of having a very valuable conversation about statins. And uh, what were the consequences for all of us? Unfortunately, in December 2016, um, everyone on the program uh, got fired, from the executive producer all the way down to the program managers, just for doing our jobs. Um, so I'm going to end it there, but I, I just want to say I've had uh, a couple of years to reflect on you know, what has happened, and I know that you know, my reputation suffered and I lost my job for just trying to do my job, but I was also trained as a scientist to ask the hard questions, to be a critical thinker, and I think if anyone finds themselves in this situation, I, I would encourage you to do the same. So thank you. If you want to read more about my story, I've published it in Staten Wars. Have we been misled by the evidence?